Hola, buenos días a todos. Espero estén bien. Eh, eh, los saluda Eduardo Garza. No me van a ver en el video por lo pronto. Eh, vamos a empezar con el video de capacitación o la, eh, la sesión de capacitación para el ensamblado y armado de una creadora de chispa directa. Eh, el orden que vamos a estar siguiendo es eh, un, una sesión de armado de creadora. Luego nos vamos a ir a algo de teoría en cuanto a la, al diseño de la tubería y tamaño de tubería. Y después vamos a venir a otra sesión, aquí donde estamos haciendo la instalación, eh, para lo que vendría siendo el cómo eh, resolver problemas que se presentan en, el, en la instalación de las creadoras. Eh, espero que sea de utilidad. Les pido, por favor, que cualquier pregunta que tengan, eh, la hagan en la sesión de preguntas, en el botón de preguntas y, y respuestas, para que las podamos contestar, de preferencia hasta el final, o si tienen algo muy puntual en el, en lo, en el paso que está haciendo en el, en el proceso de instalación o del diseño de tubería o lo que sea, este, la puedan hacer en su momento, pero preferiblemente hasta el final. La sesión, como se les había dicho originalmente, va a ser en inglés. Eh, entonces, ahí si, si las preguntas las, las pudieran formular en inglés, sería excelente, porque la persona que va a estar en la administración del, de la sesión eh, habla inglés o este, se las pueden hacer llegar a, a Luis para que él nos la transmita en, en inglés. Yo voy a estar tomando el video, por lo tanto, este, no, no va a ser posible eh, que yo esté atento a las preguntas. El Jamen Carvel, que es el, el gerente de, de soporte técnico, es quien va a estar dando la sesión de, de ensamblado, de armado, y después Ben Carvel es el que va a hacer el, la, la, este, la sesión de teoría en relación al, al diseño de tubería para las líneas de gas. Eh, espero que esta, Luis y yo, esperamos que esta capacitación sea de utilidad para todos ustedes y, y bueno, cualquier situación estamos a la orden y al pendiente de todo esto. Ok, we are going to start with the training. Eh, ahora voy a decir algo en inglés para que todos los que están en la parte de inglés me entiendan. Este, y bueno, bienvenidos a todos. Ok, we are going to start the training uh, session regarding the assembly of the brooder, a direct spark uh, Aurora brooder. So, Jamin is on video right now. So, not yet, but let's see. Okay, lights. Okay. So, you can see there him and we start doing this. <laughs> okay, good morning. My name is Jamin Carvel. As Eduardo said, I'm the tech support manager here at Valco. And uh, this morning, the first session, we're going to go over assembling the low profile Aurora Brooder. In the United States, we have the option of having this completely assembled at our factory, but due to shipping, a lot of times internationally, they order them what we call knockdown or in pieces. So this was the pieces that would have come for a brooder. And we have the canopy sitting here. My next, what I have done is I have actually pre, partially pre-assembled different steps of the brooder. So I want to go over what I have, what I have pre-assembled and what components went into that. So I have my hanger bracket and that comes in four parts. The four parts are the bracket itself, the hanger and the large washer and the nut. The next component that I have already assembled is the gas valve, the gas valve bracket, the plate, the box bottom, the box top, the board, and I've already connected the wiring connections. These are the components that, that go into, into that assembly, and I've already assembled that to help save time for one thing. The next component that I have is just the, the, the two parts of the emitter. And the next component that I have is the lower part of the gas diffuser. The gas diffuser And this is one of the things that you want to make sure as you're cleaning a brooder, this can get dirt in here and the gas 
is forced up through here. And as it comes out through the Venturi, we want to make sure that there's no dirt in here or we would get an improper burn. So during the, your cleaning process, you want to make sure that, that as your brooder is sitting here, that you definitely clean all the way around there with, with air. These take the longest bolts that go in through to hold these together. And of course, my igniter and the igniter bracket. And we have a couple odds and ends of screws and the uh, gas components and the orifice. And the last part of the assembly is the gas tube itself, the two furrows and the connectors, which I've already assembled here partially just to save time and make it easier. So we're gonna jump over here to the canopy and I'm gonna start putting this together. So I'm gonna start by dropping the, the bolt down through the center. I'm gonna turn this upside down. And my washer goes on the bottom. And the nut goes on. I want to make sure that that is good and snug. I'm also, as I'm doing this, going to line up my other, my other hole so that when I tighten this, I don't have to be moving it around. It'll fit right in. So this is my hanging point. So I want to make sure that that is good and snug. So the next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to go right straight to setting my So what I have done is I have lined up all three of my holes and I'm just going to let it sit like that for now. Now I'm going to take my my other bracket and I'm going to set that right on top. This gets a washer on top of each of the stems sticking up. Gets a nut on top of each one. Which size is that socket? This is a 10 millimeter. I also want to snug these up, not overly tight, but I want to make sure that I snug them up. Okay. Now, just to protect my board or any kind of damage, I'm going to put that cover on and I'm going to put, I'm going to wait for the screws for a little bit later. Now I'm going to turn this upside down and this end is still not connected. So I want to make sure that I hold that in place and turn this upside down because I still did not put my nuts on here yet. So the next thing I want to do is I want to put my bracket on. Now, I am not going to use, to tighten this, I am not going to use an, a ratchet because I do not want to make it extremely tight. I'm going to use something that I can control the pressure a little bit. But I am going to snug them up pretty good by hand. This piece is like a heat deflector? That is a heat deflector, yes. 
Okay. My next component is the, the bottom diffuser. And that will sit in Uh-oh. I did it already. <laughs> Maybe another one. Okay, so, so what I did here without, as I was talking, I wasn't paying attention. What I did here is this unit is turned the opposite direction. So what I'm actually going to do is I am actually going to set this on here. There we go. So we are going to start our nuts. I'm going to once again hand tighten them. So one of the things that I am looking at that I want to make sure that you understand as well is as I am putting this together, I am looking at the spark igniter and the spark igniter. I want to see it halfway between this rim and the diffuser itself, because when this creates a spark, I want my spark to go between these two electrodes, I do not want my spark to jump over to here or over to here. My spark has to go between them. If I have this unit off centered one way or the other, then my spark can jump over to the brooder and I don't get a good light when it comes time to light the brooder. So I'm looking at this and I see that the, the space between these igniter and this and this portion of the of the screen is the same as the space in here. Okay, so that part's completed. So the next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to put my gas tube on. put them in there finger tight right now and I'll come back and tighten them up later. Always want to start them finger tight to make sure that you don't get them cross threaded. If you can thread them on with your fingers, then we know that, we know that they're on, they're started correctly. That one. Okay. They're good. They're good and snug. Next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to wrap this around, bring it up through this little slot. I'm going to hold on to that 
and I'm going to flip the brooder back over again. Okay, we're going to set the brooder down. I'm going to run this through that hole. And I'm going to crimp that end. I'm gonna do the tug test, make sure that it's snug. And that gets put onto that terminal connector. So now we're gonna tighten this up. And we wanna make sure that, that these are sealed up as much as possible. This one, I would not seal up yet because that's where I'll run my incoming power from either my generator or from my controller or my thermostat. However, I would be running this, this brooder. Uh, we'll bring our incoming power in through here before we tighten that up. Our hot wire or our black wire would go to this terminal on the switch and our neutral wire or our white wire would go to the one that says common. As far as the incoming gas line, there's a plug in it and we send multiple, we send this particular uh, fitting and this fitting is designed to give you options on how you, on how you plumb it in. Uh, what we typically do in the States is we don't use this one, but we don't know what, what availability you have so this is the only thing that comes with this and you would have the choice of either using that fitting or using this fitting itself what we would prefer to do is put a sealant around this thread that in and then put a half inch hose or you can use a three eighth hose uh, to, to feed that if you use a 3 8 hose, uh, we'll get into that a little bit more in the next session, but if you were to use a 3 8 hose, the maximum length that you can go on a 3 8 hose is only from the brooder to the ceiling. If you go further than that, it does a 3 8 hose does not provide enough gas pressure or gas volume in order to run the brooder. Uh, three to four feet, uh, a meter, a little over a meter is as long as you can go on a 3 8 hose, and then you're going to start having a BTU or a pressure drop. So, uh, like I said, this once again, this top fitting does not come with the brooder. That is something that is supplied on site in the field. So, that's our brooder. Uh, just uh, th this is this is our suspension point. Our suspension point is adjustable. To find the center of the brooder so that your brooder hangs the way you want you can adjust it side to side you can also adjust it in and out this eye hook is for a safety chain the safety chain is a fail safe and we'll get into that a little bit more uh, in the next session as well but the safety chain is in case our winching system fails that we don't have a brooder that that falls down and catches our barn on fire. Uh, it's never, never a good thing, always good to be safe and to have that safety chain hooked up. The other thing is uh, we always want to make sure that we... Jamin, before you put the cover, can you repeat a little bit what pieces do you pre-assemble yes. just for the training purpose? Because they cannot see the video at that time. So if you repeat just what pieces do you pre-assemble here in the board, yep. just to show them uh, inside that connected board. Okay. So, so I have, I have the plate, the bottom board, or the, the bottom cover for the board, and actually goes this way, and the board goes on top of it. There is four little washers each goes on the stud that holds the board in place 
Then I have four nuts that go on top of those washers. These do not get tight and very tight either because we can damage the board or crack the board if we over tighten them. Just snug so the board is held in place. Then we have the igniter or the gas bracket. The gas bracket goes on here. And we have two screws that look like that that hold this in place. Then we have the gas valve. The gas valve sits on here and gets fastened with two self-tapping screws that go into each hole right there. The the hook gets fastened on here. One nut on the top, one nut on the bottom, and they get tightened to pinch it in place so that it can't move and it's rigid. As far as the board goes, one's one of the, these, these are both uh, electrical connectors and we have two different size holes, one large one, one small one. The other hole is for the switch. The switch I did not lay out here, but the switch goes in here. We have a ground wire and we have a black wire. As you can see in here, the ground wire gets connected with this. The ground goes here. The blue gets connected to this end. Pull them together. They go right in there. And they go on the one that is marked C on the board itself. Blue wire and ground wire get connected to the C like that. The red wire coming from the gas valve goes to the MV. Both red wires get connected to that. Both blue wires get connected to this one. And then the ground goes to th this wire and then goes over to, gets actually mounted to ground the brooder for safety reasons. The black wire, as you can see in here, goes from the W1 to the switch. And then our incoming hot or black wire also goes to the switch. That's the, the one that's not hooked up right now. And then our white wire goes to the common, which is right next to the blue wire. We will see it in the other uh, brother yes. already connected, right? Yeah, it's a little confusing because there's a lot of wires, but yes. Okay, so that is our brooder assembly. Uh, does anyone have any questions that uh, you would like to ask about the assembly of the brooder? Okay, if you don't have any questions, bueno, si, perdón, I'm going to say this in Spanish. Si no tienen ninguna pregunta, vamos eh, respecto al ensamblado de la creadora, eh, vamos a, a la sesión teórica del diseño de tuberías y si tienen alguna pregunta escríbanla por ahí y ahorita tratamos de, de contestarla eh, ok, we are going to eh, go with Ben Carvel he is going to eh, talk a little bit about how do we need to size the pipe eh, sizing, do the sizing of the pipes for the gas inside the house ok, let's go Ben ok Good morning, everyone. Thanks for tuning in and thanks, Jamin and Eduardo. I'm going to 
share my screen here. All right, yeah, so uh, we're going to go through, as Jamin um, talked about, we're gonna go through um, some of the criteria uh, that we need for sizing piping, uh, so our supply piping. Um, we're gonna look through um, the presentation that you guys sent first. Uh, you guys sent a PDF. Um, so I'm just gonna flip through some of the slides um, and just comment real quick before we get into the meat of the presentation. Um, you guys had sent that this is your site layout with six barns. Um, and I believe talking, um, so the tanks are at the, the end of the six barn site. Uh, and then you have a supply pipe going um, from the tanks and the first stage regulator to second stage regulators that are at each barn. Uh, and then for each barn, um, you guys had provided this layout. Um, our understanding is that the supply pressure from the tanks is 10 PSI. Um, and then 10 PSI to the second stage regulator. Uh, and then we're going from underground to the second stage regulator and then into um, a pipe that is uh, going vertical and then across the ceiling and then into the house layout. Um, so you have some um, dimensions of tubes here and pipes. Um, one thing that I would note as Jamin was, um, was discussing um, is just the tubing, the orange tubing. Um, we've, we saw in your um, presentations that several locations uh, of the tubing. Um, the picture on the left here uh, shows that you have um, quite a bit of extra tubing wired up. I'm not sure if you guys are moving the brooders to other locations, um, but uh, as we'll look at with pressure drop um, and the amount of pressure drop because of the length of the tubes, um, this would um, this would be something that we would recommend that you shorten to just the um, the minimum amount required to raise and lower the brooder in the location that you have it. Um, so that's something that we'll we'll get into and note. Um, so we come in and we tee off and we go down the line and then there's orange tubing um, providing the supply to each of the brooders. Okay, so I guess we're having some technical difficulties with the other with the other uh, uh, friction section. So. We're gonna jump over to this and we're gonna do some troubleshooting on the brooder. Uh, one of the questions that we've already received is that um, I think Julian said that uh, you have some brooders that a spark is sparking one way or the other, either to the emitter or to the frame of the brooder. So we're gonna jump right into that and I'm gonna show you in, on this brooder where the spark should be and then we'll go over some troubleshooting as to what you might look at to try to resolve that issue because that is a problem and that will create brooders that light one time and don't light another because the gas and the spark are not coming in contact with each other. So we've turned the gas off to this brooder so that you can see the spark. So it would actually time out uh, and we would get our three flashing lights, but I'm not going to let it get to that point. So I'm gonna turn this brooder on and hopefully you can see the spark. So we have the spark, I'll do it one more time. We have the spark that's going between the, the two electrodes and is not arcing to the brooder itself. Aquí tienen que ser bien este, cuidadosos. Eh, desgraciadamente, cuando se envía la creadora desarmada, pues los, los, las piezas pueden doblar en el manejo, en el, en el traslado. Entonces, este, siempre tener mucho cuidado de que los electrodos estén entre, entre la, el espacio que queda, como decía Jamen, el espacio que queda entre la, entre la eh, mampara 
y el, y el quemador para que estén siempre en el centro y la chispa sea entre las dos piezas del electrodo. So there is one other issue that can cause a, a poor spark and that would be a bad ground. So a ground is something that is really, really, really important on a brooder because we are sending a high voltage that has nowhere to go. And because we're sending that high voltage, it is going to try to find the path of least resistance. So we have to have a good ground. So it is important, as we showed in that last video, that our ground, the green wire, is hooked up as we, as we said, and also that our ground is hooked up in our main control box. So if we don't have a good ground following through the whole way through, we can end up with the spark jumping over to the brooder and following the home run line back because that's where it finds its ground. So we want to make sure that the control, the board, and all the electrical components are grounded. That, that's also very important. That will cause some spark issues as well. Weak sparks or sparks at places that we don't want can also cause damage to a board if we don't have good grounding. So Moving on, hopefully that answers that question. Uh, moving on, so what we are going to do here is the first thing we're gonna do is before any brooder is fired up, you should always do a leak test. A leak test ensures that we don't have gas leaking into the barn unknowingly and we end up with some kind of explosion and people getting hurt or a fire. Certainly not something that we wanna see. So I have water in a spray bottle mixed with some soap. And I'm gonna spray this on all of the fittings to make sure that the brooder that I installed, all the fittings are tight and that I don't have any gas seeping out at places that I don't want. So to do that, I'm just gonna spray water on there with a little bit of soap mixed in. And if I have any leaks, I'll have bubbles coming out. I do not see any bubbles. So I'm gonna go down through and I'm gonna hit every fitting and I have a good, a good tight seal there. I'm also gonna hit here. And I, I, I don't have any, any leaks anywhere. So, so that's, that's a good thing. Now we would be ready to fire the brooder up. So what we're gonna do first is I'm gonna show you how to test uh, a brooder. So to test the brooder, we have two ports on either side Top and bottom, there are two ports. The bottom one I can use to test to see if the gas valve is working properly. So when my gas valve closes, I should have a zero pressure or it'll slowly go down to zero, which means my gas valve is closing completely and also opening completely. The top one I can use, that is before the gas valve. So then I can measure my line pressure before the brooder turns on and after, during the, the ignition period and also while my brooder is burning. So first off, I'm gonna remove the bottom one. And I am going to install a gas tester. Okay, so the first thing I wanna do, let me uh, take this back off. First thing I wanna do is I wanna make sure that my, that I'm zeroed out. So I'm at zero, there I'm bouncing. So I'm gonna just zero this out. So I'm sure that I'm getting an accurate reading prior to hooking it up. Now I'm gonna, I'm gonna hook my brooder up and I have just a tiny little bit of pressure coming through. Okay, so now we're gonna turn the gas on. Okay, so the gas is turned on. Now I'm gonna light my brooder and you'll be able to watch the gas valve open up. 
So there my brooder lit. And I'm running at 10.82 inches. Okay. Now I'm going to turn my brooder back off. And I'll slowly watch. The gas valve has now closed and my pressure will drop down. And it'll keep dropping down and it'll keep dropping down as gas seeps up through the brooder and empties that line out. Okay, so my gas is off. So I'm gonna turn my gas off. My pressure is, is dropping down to nothing. That's how I can test my, my gas valve. Now I'm going to remove this. <coughs> I'm gonna take my valve back out. Hay que recordar siempre cerrar la el suministro de gas cuando se quitan esos eh, tapones para evitar que tengamos algún problema eh, por acumulación de gas. Okay, so prior to firing up the brooder, I want to make sure that I test that and make sure that I don't get any gas bubbles out of there because now I've, I've taken this fitting out. So I want to make sure that I, so I have no, no bubbles. Now I'm going to test the top one and the top one is where we're going to be doing the rest of our testing. This basically the bottom. You lost us. Okay. Okay. So now I'm going to remove the top fitting. Okay, so now we're gonna turn the gas back on. We have 13.75 inches of water column without the brooder running. So now what we're gonna do is we're gonna turn the brooder on. Our brooder is running and we have dropped down to 12.86 inches of water column with this brooder, and let's just say this brooder is the end of the line in our barn. So with all brooders running, we have 12.87. 12.87 is in our tolerance. Our tolerance that we are allowed to run the brooder at is no less than 11 inches of water column with all brooders going and no more than 14 inches of water column. So in the last brooder, in the last brooder or in every brooder, but with all brooders going. Okay. So we're going to let this burn for a little bit. And we're going to let this turn a uh, nice, bright cherry red as it's supposed to be burning. And while we're waiting for this to, to heat up and to turn a nice, a nice red, we're going to go over the brooder, the way it's hanging and uh, some things that I want to make sure that I didn't cover before that I'm covering now. So my incoming wire, uh, this is my power supply for the brooder itself. You see, I ran that in with, uh, with the gas valve wires. We have a big enough fitting that allows you to run that in there. I always run with my cover on. The cover helps to keep dust and dirt and debris off of the board. Dust, dirt, and debris in excess can suck up moisture which moisture is not good on the board. So we want to make sure if we keep the dust off of the board, then we keep the moisture away from the board. We have a safety chain that is hooked up in the case of a fail of our winching system. The safety chain is always hooked to a different anchor point because if we have one anchor fail, 
then our safety also fails. So we wanna make sure that we have two anchor points for each brooder, one for the safety, one for the winch line. My brooder is sitting, as you can see here, my brooder is not sitting perfectly level. My highest point just slightly on the opposite side of the gas valve and the control. That's a purposeful thing. We want to see it slightly tapered. The reason is because any excess heat as it rolls out here, rolls off the other side and helps to protect our gas valve and our board. So as we, as we uh, wait for this thing to get, it's, it's burning pretty decent right now. So one of the things that I wanna do, we wanna go into some troubleshooting and some troubleshooting on the gas system. I'm gonna, I'm gonna take, a, I'm gonna take, I'm gonna use a, a infrared thermometer here and I'm going to just shoot. So I have 561 degrees Fahrenheit. I'll just shoot it again. I have 590 degrees Fahrenheit. I'll just shoot it one more time. I have 595. It's still heating up a little bit. So I have 597. So it's running right around 600 degrees Fahrenheit is the temperature that's running. Now, keep in mind, without the brooder running, we had 13.73 or right around there. With the brooder running, we had 12.83. That's because we're using a 3 8 inch hose. A 3 8 inch hose is dropping our supply. Even though it's a short line, it is dropping our supply by one inch. So that means right now, right off the bat, we know that our three inch hose, our three eighth inch hose is a restriction in our line. Even though it's a short section, it is still a restriction in our line. So now what we're gonna do is we have the option here to cut back our gas piping size. So we're gonna cut back our gas piping size. And what you're gonna see is you're gonna see that as we cut it back, you're gonna start to see brown spots instead of a nice red glow. You're gonna to start to see brown spots that appear because we're not actually getting, we're starving the brooder of gas because we don't have a large enough pipe coming into the, the brooder. So we've cut the gas pressure down So we're at, so we've cut it down now and with our brooder running, we're at 8.61 inches of water column. The brooder's still running, but what you're gonna start to see is you're gonna start to see the red slowly disappear. And as the red slowly disappears, so does our heat. So we're not at a 40,000 BTU heater anymore. We're running actually less than that now because we're, So right now we're at 420 degrees instead of the almost 600 degrees. All we've done is we've restricted the supply coming to the brooder by just a small amount. And that small amount has, we've seen that in the pressure decrease with all of our brooders running. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to turn this brooder off. Watch the, when I turn the brooder off, I'm still, my incoming pressure is still 3.9, 13.9 inches of water column. But when my brooder lights, I drop down below the 11 inches. The brooder still works. It's not burning very well at all. You can see the yellow flames coming out of it. It's still burning, but I am not getting the efficiency that this brooder was meant to have. So one of the sure tail signs that you can tell if your brooder is being starved
for uh, for gas is to test it. We should never be running, ever be running below 11 inches of water column with all brooders in the barn operating. So right now I'm running at 475 degrees compared to our 600 degrees. So although the brooder's working, it's below our spec, you will end up having problems. You'll have a bad burn, which the bad burn, anytime you see the yellow flames, means it's a bad burn. And a bad burn could mean, if you have proper gas pressure, could also mean the brooder is dirty and that it needs cleaned. But one way to tell that is to hook up a gas pressure and test your gas pressure. If you have low gas pressure, you're going to be making your brooders dirty because you have unburnt propane coming out and sticking to everything. So, so we're going to turn the pressure back up or the, the pipe size back up and you're going to see it start to glow red again. Now we can see with all of our brooders going, we're back at 13 inches of water column with our brooder off. We're at 14.26 right now, inches of water column. We're right around 14 inches of water column. Turn our brooder back on. We can watch the pressure drop down and it's dropping down to, with it, with it burning and all the others burning, 12.9 uh, inches of water column. So that's one portion of the troubleshooting process is our gas pressures. So the next thing we're going to cover is we're going to cover our electrical end because we have, this is a, a direct spark. So we have a twofold troubleshooting step on this. First would be the gas pressure, which we've covered. The second would be the electrical end of it. So I'm going to turn this brooder off. We're going to turn the gas off. I'm going to remove my tester. And I'm going to put my plug back in it. Okay, gas on. Okay, our gas is back on. Now here you can see when I hit this, I have a little bit of a gas leak. See a little bubbles going around there? Okay, so we wanna make sure that we don't have any gas leaks before powering that brooder back up because a gas leak is not a good situation for anyone in the barn or the animals or for fire hazards. Okay, so, so the next thing we're gonna do, uh, the gas is on so we can test this. So now we're going to test the electrical end of it. So for the electrical end of it, I'm gonna take this box off. Okay, so I'm going to take the cover off. My brooder is a little warm, so I have to be a little careful. Okay, so the next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to hand that to Eduardo, and I am going to test the incoming electrical supply. So I can, to test this, I can come off of any one of my black wires on the switch. I do have to have my brooder on though. So watch, it's gonna turn on. And I go to my ground. And I have 23.5 volts AC coming to my board. The maximum is 24 volts and 24 volts is what the transformer puts out. 20 volts is the minimum that we can see at the board. 
If we have less than 20 volts, then we have start to have issues with either a spark We can have problems with either a spark that is weak, or we can have problems with a gas valve that will not open properly, or we can have problems with the board where there's just not enough power for the board. And it is a smart board. It has functions to it. So if the board has functions and it doesn't have the power to run it, then the brooder doesn't work the way it's intended to work. So I'm going to come to my transformer and my incoming power is on the top. My outgoing power is on the bottom. So I'm gonna test across my outgoing and I have 24 volts coming out of this transformer going to the brooder. So I know that this transformer right now is working properly. It's putting the correct amount of voltage out. So any problems that I have with the brooder are going to be either in the wiring or the size of wiring going to my brooder. So what we're going to do is we're going to simulate that there is a that there is a problem. And um, so we're going to measure here and to simulate that problem, we're going to be right around 18 volts or something like that on this brooder with the brooder running. So I'm going to test here. Ouch, that's hot. Okay, so I'm at 17.6 volts coming to this brooder. So I know that at the, there I have 18 volts coming to this brooder. So I know that at the transformer, I had 24 volts, but at the brooder, I have 18 volts and that is not enough to properly run this unit. So one of the things I'm gonna do to do some troubleshooting, I'm going to try to figure out what is going on, um, what, what is going on with this. So the first thing I'm going to do, part of a, a, a standard troubleshooting step, is let's go turn off. Let's let's say we have 18 brooders in this barn, and all brooders are running right now, and I'm testing the end one, and I have 18 volts. So one thing that I can do to test it is I can go down my line, and I'm going to turn off six brooders. So when I turn off six brooders, I want to see if my voltage increases or if it stays the same. If my voltage increases, then I know that there's a good chance that I'm either running too many brooders for the length of the wire run and I'm losing voltage and amperage as I go down the line, or I have a bad connection somewhere that I have to go and try to figure out. So I'm going to test this again. So I have turned off six brooders out, out of this line and I look at it and hmm, look at that. My voltage went up to 19.2. So now what that's telling me is as I start to turn load off of the barn, now all of a sudden my voltage is coming up, which is telling me that I may not have a wiring, a, a wire connection issue but I just may have too long of a run and I have to either run a heavier gauge wire or I may have to use another transformer to get the power to the end of the line to supply my minimum of 20 volts. So we've gone back over our line. We have, we have uh, uh, checked all of our connections. Huh? Yeah, I have checked all of my all of my uh, connections and now I'm going to go back and I'm going to test it again and during our process it just so happens that we found uh, a loose connection and we're at 20.5 volts right now 20.6 and that is within the acceptable range of a brooder being able to operate. So, you know, we found we found a bad connection somewhere. We can turn all of our brooders back on, make sure that we still have 20 volts with all of our uh, brooders going. And as long as we have the 20 volts, 
our, our operating system on the board, the gas valve and the spark will operate properly. Uh, I don't think in your situation, from what I understand, you mostly have 18, 18 brooders in each barn. I don't think it's gonna be an issue, but 25 direct spark brooders is the maximum amount for one transformer. But that is dependent on how long the run of wire is and also the gauge of wire. So we have to make sure that we have a heavy enough wire to carry the voltage the whole way to the end of the barn. If we were to use a small gauge wire, then we may have to purchase another transformer and put another transformer down the barn somewhere so that we're running less brooders for a very long run. In a typical situation, you can run 25 brooders off of this off of this transformer as long as the wire gauge is correct. So I think that's all I have. Uh, does anyone have any questions on troubleshooting a brooder? Okay, we can come back around uh, again later and answer any questions that we might have. And uh, we'll, we'll probably just transfer it over to Ben if he's ready to go. I will, I hope so. Uh, I will try this again and uh, try to get this presentation working. Okay, we, we had talked about um, your site layout um, with uh, 10 PSI coming from the tanks and then um, mm -hmm. your barn supply line. So as we go through um, the gas sizing, um, we're going to be using, um, well, there's a variety of places that you could get some, some information on um, gas sizing. Um, there's uh, a national fuel gas code um, that we have here in the United States. Um, there's also an international fuel gas code. Mm -hmm. um, the one that I am going to be using is the 2018 one. Um, if you if you do some Google searches, uh, you could actually download um, some of those and find those. Um, there's probably newer versions, but I haven't found um, that some of the charts and stuff that we'll use really updates um, that much from uh, revision to revision. Um, the other thing that you can use is there are um, servicemen's handbooks, um, and I have a few listed here. Um, the, the LP gas serviceman's handbook um, from Fisher and Emerson uh, is a pretty good one and has some of the same charts in it and um, some useful information. So um, you guys can um, can find some of those resources. There again, the, the LP serviceman's handbook, the red one on the screen, um, I've found that as a, a free PDF download as well. So um, the method that we would use from um, the International um, Fuel Gas Code is called the longest, longest length method. Um, and you can find that, um, Eduardo, you could check with them. And if they, if they can't get the, the International Fuel Gas Code handbook, um, uh, we could help them find the PDF, but um, the one that I'm referencing is on page 46 of the 2018 edition. So the longest length method, you basically are looking for the longest length from your supply to the furthest appliance or um, item that you're uh, providing fuel to, whether that's a brooder or whether that is a, uh, a barn, a uh, second stage regulator. Um, and then you use that in the charts. Um, so within the charts, um, there's, uh, I think most of these charts are in chapter four um, of that, um, of that uh, International Fuel Gas Code Handbook. Um, and you'll note a couple different things in these charts um, to make sure that you're selecting the right chart when you're sizing the, the gas line. Um, you notice at the top, um, Table 4, 402.4, um, Schedule 40 Metallic Pipe. Um, so that's one of the things that you need to look for is to make sure that the materials that you're using um, match what chart you're looking at. Um, so the first thing you look at is the actual type of material. The second thing at the right hand um, side on the top, um, you'll notice 
the inlet pressure, you'll notice the gas. Uh, the gas in this one is um, propane. The inlet pressure is 10 PSI. And you'll notice also a pressure drop that is one PSI. So for any length, um, you see the nominal length ID um, from 10 to 600 feet. Um, for any given length, if you follow that row across the chart, um, if you um, size your line right for the capacity that's listed in the chart in BTUs per hour, then this chart would say that you would you should have no more than one PSI drop from your supply to the end of the line by using this method. Um, there are different charts. Here's a Schedule 40 metallic pipe table. But in this case, if you look at the inlet pressure, it's only at 11 inches of, of water column. Um, so that would be um, more for the barn rather than the main supply line. Um, so there again, making sure that we're looking at the right charts for um, the, the, the gas type, the inlet pressure, and the pressure drop that's acceptable. So in this chart, you would have half an inch of water column loss um, from your supply to the end of the line by using the longest length method. Um, and then here is 11 inches of water column, but this is more of a gas tubing um, chart. So you can see the, the gas tight is just one, one vendor um, that supplies this type of, of hosing. Um, but the important thing is um, the ID of the tube. Um, so finding a chart with um, the same, um, there's also in, in these tubes, um, there's ribs in it, which has more pressure loss than say a smooth tube. Um, so making sure that you have the right table when you're using this chart ensures that um, the chart will give the, the accurate pressure drop. The other thing that should be noted is um, the length of line and the pressure drop in the line is also indicated um, or dropped even further by the number of fittings. Um, if you have 90 degree fittings or if you have uh, a T off, uh, anytime that you're um, that you're adding restriction or you're forcing that um, the fuel to, to turn, you have more pressure drop. Um, so there are tables in Appendix A of the International Fuel Gas Code that you can use um, that relates the type of fitting that you have um, to the equivalent length of line. Um, so when you're sizing your line, you would look at all your fittings and you would add those lengths to your line. Um, So in this case, um, I am going to be um, looking and starting with the barn itself. Um, so we see in this barn um, that we have 18 brooders. Um, so our appliance is the brooders. So one of the first things that we want to do um, is we want to look at the specifications on the brooder itself. Um, and so when we look at the specifications of the brooder, we see um, a couple things. Um, one, this is, this is taken right out of the Aurora brooder manual. Um, so this is the model that you guys uh, had purchased. Um, and so you can see that there are several um, different columns. Uh, ben, just to give, me, give you uh, two or three minutes to figure out uh, I'm going to jump up and ask them if they have some questions in Spanish and give you some time. Okay. Bueno, este, en lo que Ben trata de ver ahí algunos, algunos detalles eh, técnicos, lo que él quiere hacer es este, poder rayar en la pantalla y, e indicarles eh, eh, algunas cosas de las que está hablando para que sea más práctico entender lo que él está explicando. Entonces, eh, vamos a ver si lo puede solucionar ahorita. Ayer funcionaba, ahorita no, pero... Eh, lo va a tratar de corregir. Eh, yo les pido, por favor, que si tienen alguna, alguna pregunta, eh, la escriban en el, en el chat y la pueden hacer en español ahorita. Ahorita voy a ser yo el que va a estar ahí contestando para algunas cosas. Y, y bueno, lo, lo importante de todo esto, de los problemas que se habían presentado eh, específicamente en, en Colombia, eh, en, en cuanto a lo que platicaba Julián, 
vendría siendo el tema de la, del chispa en el electrodo. Eh, ahí lo que les decía hace rato, hay que estar bien claros de qué es eh, lo que está sucediendo. ¿sí? O sea, que tengamos esa distancia entre el electrodo y la, y la campana que se pone de color rojo, eh, que no esté tan pegado y que esté en la parte intermedia entre el quemador y, y la mampara, para que de esa manera el arco sea entre el electrodo y, y el sensor que trae, para que el arco sea ahí y no sea entre la mampara o el quemador. ¿sí? Este, desgraciadamente, cuando nosotros embarcamos estas piezas, como bien saben, van desarmadas para el tema de volumen de embarque. Eh, es importante que, que, el, que veamos que ese espacio esté bien porque se pudo haber doblado en el, en el trayecto. Eh, desgraciadamente, el, en, cuando las cargan o cuando las hacen la maniobra en el contenedor, las descargan, eh, las, las personas que lo hacen no saben lo que hay adentro y, y se pueden dañar algunas, algunas piezas, este, doblar un poquito de más o de menos y eso nos podría ocasionar algún problema ahí. Eh, entonces, eh, para que lo consideren, y, y bueno, no sé si tengan alguna duda, alguna pregunta, este, a mí me eh, interesa que... Eduardo, pri sí, bueno, bien. primero, Rodrigo, Rodrigo. Rodrigo, no, perdón. No, no, soy tan grande, ¿eh? soy yo nomás, <risa> soy yo nomás, Rodrigo Jara. Oye, eh, lo primero, eh, la verdad es que eh, además de este tema que, que se entiende... Eh, muy buena la presentación, o sea, la, la, la forma de cómo lo presentaron y cómo lo estamos viendo, eh, muy bien, ¿ah? eh, muy práctico, y, y de verdad que, que, que Pablo creo que por la mayoría de que está bien hecho, ¿sí? se, se nota mucho y los detalles de las mediciones y las pruebas que se están realizando es súper, súper eh, bueno, ya eso es como un comentario más que una pregunta. Y como pregunta... Hay algo que, que me pareció súper interesante, que es la medición, ¿cierto?, de, de la campana, de la temperatura de la criadora, y sería interesante que pudiéramos tener como una relación de esa temperatura con el correcto funcionamiento de esta. ¿Qué quiere decir eso? Nosotros sabemos que hoy día en Quinsagro, por ejemplo, ya están funcionando las criadoras, pero sería interesante que con una medida indirecta de la temperatura de la criadora en sí, nosotros pudiéramos saber eh, en qué porcentaje de su capacidad total está trabajando. No sé si eso es posible. Por ejemplo, decir, mira, las criadoras están todas encendidas, están funcionando, pero están trabajando, por ejemplo, solamente un 80%. ¿Eso es posible hacerlo con la medición de temperatura que, que mostraron en, en el video? Este, dame dame un, dos, diez segundos, lo pregunto, y este, yo creería que sí podríamos tener un valor de referencia, y, este, y, te, lo, y te lo digo. Dame un segundo, se lo, lo voy a poner aquí mute para preguntarlo, y te contesto. Ok, este, bueno, me, me comenta Rodrigo que no podemos dar un valor como tal, lo vamos a, a, a revisar, pero ¿por qué? Porque si, te, si les decimos el, el valor debe ser debe andar en cerca de los 600 grados Fahrenheit, como lo vimos ahorita, que estaba trabajando la creadora adecuadamente y llegó a los, a los 600, y este, o debemos ser muy cuidadosos en el cómo solucionarlo, porque si no está llegando a los 600 grados Fahrenheit, eh, y lo que, vamos, ¿qué es lo que vamos a buscar hacer, subirle la presión al gas, este, en lugar de a lo mejor de buscar el problema eh, original del por qué no está llegando a esa temperatura. Y al momento de subir la, la presión del gas a más de 14 pulgadas de columna de agua, podríamos estar uh, este, dañando algunos componentes como la válvula, este, que, no, que no soporta mayor, mayor presión. Este, entonces podríamos tener ese, esa problemática. Ah, eh, ya, entonces, pero, uh -huh. pero no, está perfecto, pero poniéndolo en la base, pongámoslo en la base en que nosotros vamos a respetar... Eh, eh, diámetros de cañería, ¿cierto? Y que no vamos a cambiar la presión que es una parte de diseño, o sea, la presión con la que va a trabajar el sistema S, que son, supongamos, las 14 pulgas de, 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 de columnas de agua, ¿cierto? Sí. Eh, ¿tú, tú puedes, básicamente, el ejemplo lo, de un sagro que lo, me... lo entiendo y, y sé a lo que te refieres. Lo voy a y, y es un número, algo. ojo, es un número para nosotros. Referencia no, interna para, para, para estar seguro que están. Y que claro. estamos sacando el máximo provecho a la, a la unidad. Porque con lo que tú me dices hoy día, yo podría ir a Quinsagro, por ejemplo, medir las criadoras, y si no tengo esos 500 o 600 Fahrenheit, <coughs> pongamos un ejemplo, tengo 470, y tengo uh -huh. 470 en todo, yo podría decir, ok, tengo la presión correcta, 
¿sí? Tengo la medida del cable, o sea, no tengo la pérdida de voltaje, sí. tengo la chispa bien puesta, que es lo que hemos revisado hoy día, ¿cierto? Sí. El único tema es la, el diámetro de la cañería. No sé si me explico. Sí, claro, claro, lo, lo entiendo. Entonces, con eso este... podríamos saber simplemente dónde estamos parados, nada más. Pero a eso me ayuda. No vamos a buscar lo, yo, aumentar la presión. ¿Mm? De acuerdo, yo lo, yo lo sigo planteando fuera de, del foro y les, mando una, les mandamos una respuesta por, por escrito para eso. Sí, sí, es como para tener una referencia. Tú deberías tener aproximadamente, bajo buenas condiciones, en esta criadora, por ejemplo, los 600 Fahrenheit. Acuerdo, so, es como un, da, es un dato que nosotros, ah, mira, esto está bien, eh, hay una criadora que está encendida, porque fue súper bueno el video donde se veía qué que pasaba cuando se apagaba la criadora con la presión, ¿cierto? Es que, uh -huh. que sube, si enciende, baja la presión, ¿qué pasa con el voltaje? Pero cuando ya solucionamos, el, si tenemos una correcta chispa, tenemos el voltaje indicado, ¿cierto? Y la presión indicada, podríamos ver qué tanto está influyendo en ese momento eh, el diámetro del, 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 de la cañería. De la claro. claro. Ahorita, sí. ahorita lo que vamos a ver, este, ahorita con Ben, nos va a ayudar a ver esa situación para saber también cómo manejarlo. Este, pero yo, yo me comprometo a, a tratar de sacar un valor y ver si es posible que le bueno. demos ese número y, este, y se los mandamos por... Este, se los vale. yo, yo les contesto esa, esa situación. ¿Sale? Vale, este, sí, ben, es... Solo una referencia, Eduardo, nada más. Claro, de acuerdo. Ah. Este, bueno, ya, ya ven, está, está listo, entonces le voy a transferir ahí el, el micrófono para que siga con su presentación y ahorita seguimos conversando en caso de que haya alguna otra pregunta. Ben, uh, you are ready to go. Yeah, so we had gotten to the brooder. Um, so we see, so we see that uh, we have 40,000 BTUs um, and that's BTUs per hour um, per brooder. Um, so that's the same with all of these, but we do note a difference in um, pressure. Um, we have a five PSI uh, brooder, but we also have um, the lower pressure brooders. Uh, the lower pressure brooders are the ones that we have. Um, so we see that we, um, we have two different um, pressure ratings. Um, so 11 inches of water column um, is the minimum that is required. Um, and we also have a maximum, so we do not want to be more than um, 14 inches of water column. Um, the more gas that we supply, um, the more um, BTU output um, the brooder will output, and then um, it'll exceed the design criteria, so uh, components selected and uh, things like that. Um, dictate uh, what the max pressure would be and the min pressure uh, to get a good burn as Jamin was uh, showing as well. So because of that 11 inches of water column, um, we know the table that we need to use. Um, and so the table that we need to use has uh, an inlet um, pressure of 11 inches of water column. Um, and we also um, had talked about using Schedule 40, which is, I believe, what is in um, your barn right now. Um, so when we get into a little bit more details of the chart, um, we need to look at um, several things in order to size our pipeline right. We need to look at the column, which is in feet. Ultimately, our goal is to come up with a number from this row, which is the pipe size. And so in order to determine the pipe size, we need to find some number in this region that correlates a length to a pipe size. Um, so I would just point out a few things. Um, one is that the capacity, these numbers in this chart uh, is capacity in thousands of BTUs per hour. Um, so for example, when we are looking at this number right here, the actual BTU output would be times 1000. So the actual output there would be 1,150, but it's in thousands. 
So it's actually 1,150,000 BTUs per hour. Um, so just something to note because our brooder was in 40,000 BTUs per hour. Uh, so on this chart, one brooder would just show up as 40 instead of um, 40,000. So we have um, the chart selected. So the first step in determining what, um, what row we use in our table is to determine the longest length to any brooder. Um, so we had talked about um, this section right here. And in reality, um, we know that we have our barn And we know that we have our regulator here, um, but we have a pipe that is coming up before we even get to this black point here. Um, and I believe your outside um, or your sidewall height is like 2.5 meters. Um, so we have to add that to this length um, prior to coming into the barn. So whenever we're trying to determine uh, the length of any line. Um, we know that this section then is our 7.1 meters plus our 2.5 meters from this guy right here. So we have 9.6 meters getting into the T. Once we get into the T, let's look at um, the right branch. Um, so if we look at the length of this guy right here for the right branch, we can see that we have some dimensions here from your sketch of nine meters, 13, 13, 13, 13. So if we add those guys together, we have our right branch, which is nine plus 13 plus 13 plus 13 plus 13. So when we have that guy, uh, and if we add those up, we get, 61 meters. So that's our right branch. Uh, and then as Jamin was talking about, we also have um, a tube here. So we have another length that's right here. So if we use and look at our tube, now we have this tube length um, at least this dimension right here from the dashed line to the dashed line is um, our half barn width, which was the 7.1 meters um, minus three. So 7.1 and then minus three is giving us 4.1 meters. Um, but then our brooder isn't right at the, the ceiling. Um, if we go back to our sketch here, we're coming out here and then we're dropping down a little bit um, before we have our brooder. Um, so we're gonna add another, uh, say meter. Um, so we look at 5.1 meters. So to determine then this whole length, which is from our supply to our furthest appliance, which ends up being a brooder on this, this side, then we add the 9.6 plus 61 plus 5.1. And that gives us 75.7 meters. Uh, and our chart is in feet rather than meters. So if we go ahead and convert that to feet, we would multiply by 3.281 and that would give us 200, oops, 248.36 feet. So this would be the row that we would need to use, the dimension that we would need to use in our table. Um, 
And we could go ahead and see if this one is longer than the other one. Um, in this barn, um, we, we know it's not um, because this dimension is the same length uh, across the barn and this dimension is the same length. So we really just need to compare this. Um, and we see that seven meters plus um, 13 meters plus 14 meters plus another 13 meters ends up only being um, 47 meters. Um, so it would be comparing 47 to 47 to um, 61. So uh, the right branch then is the longest length. Um, and so we will be using uh, the 248.36 feet as the longest length um, from our supply regulator um, to the furthest appliance. So then when we look at the graph or the chart that we're using, um, as we had talked about, um, we're looking at this area and this area, and we see that we are using the right chart um, so then we're going down the column and we see that um, looking at the max length, we have 248. Um, so we have 200 and 250. Um, so we're going to be looking at this row. So whenever you're going down through um, and you have 248, this is 200. So you want to jump to the next call, the next row um, to the length that uh, is greater than or equal to the length that you determined. So that gives us then um, a row to work off of. Um, and then obviously we need another, um, another value in order to select our pipe size. Um, we need to know the capacity uh, that is in each branch. So if we go back to our site layout again, the first branch that we're going to look at um, is this branch. So how many brooders are running off of that branch of the pipeline? So we know that there are 18 brooders in the entire barn and all of that fuel is being supplied through that branch. Um, so we know that we have a 40,000 BTU per hour brooder. And we know that we have 18 brooders. So if we multiply that out, we find that we have 720,000 BTUs per hour of supply gas that's going through that first branch. Um, so as we talked about in that chart, um, we need to divide by 1,000 in order to get um, the values that are listed in the capacity chart. Um, so we're really just uh, removing the three zeros. Um, so we would be looking at 720, um, and this would be actually in thousands of BTUs per hour as the unit. So uh, we use the same chart. We use our longest length, which is the row at 250, 250 feet. So now we also have our capacity in order to size our pipe size for that first branch. So as we follow that row out through, we see we need more than 500, um, but our 749 um, fits the needs. So we're in this column. And so we can go up and we can catch the pipe size required for that first line, which is one and a half inch pipe. Next, we are going to look at the right branch. 
So we're going to look at this section of pipe. Um, so let's look at the first segment. So in this section of pipe right here, we need to evaluate how many brooders we're running in that section of pipe. We're supplying nine of them. So our 40,000 BTUs per brooder times our nine brooders. And this gives us 360,000 BTUs per hour. And so we remember that we're actually looking at 360 um, for our value because we're looking at the BTUs um, per thousand or uh, per thousand BTUs for the chart. So if we're looking at our um, our chart again for the sizing of this, um, we're looking at for 360. So we need more than the one inch because that's only 243, um, but our 500 um, will meet the capacity requirements. Um, so we're looking up and we see that this section, which is 360 needs a one and one quarter inch pipe. And so we can go ahead and do this for the next segment. So the next segment would be our 40,000 BTUs times eight brooders. And that would be 320,000, which is 320. So we go back to the chart and we see that we're still up at one and a quarter pipe size as the requirement for this section. So that's one and a quarter still. So the next section, we know that we need times seven, um, or we're reducing this by 40,000 BTUs. So we're at 280,000, so 280. Go back to our chart and we see that we still are in the one and a quarter for that section um, because we've exceeded the, the capacity capabilities of the one inch. So we're still at one and one quarter. For this section then, now we've dropped this to six brooders. Um, so we've dropped this by another 40,000 BTUs. So we're at 240 instead of the 280. So 240 now, we have enough capacity in a one inch to meet the needs of six brooders. So in this one now, we can actually use a one inch. The next section, now we have five, so this is 200, 200, we still need the one inch. And we can go ahead and do four, three, two, and one. to speed up the process a little bit. So we're going to drop this one by another 40,000 BTUs. So we're at 160 and then we're at 120 and then we're at 80 and then we're at 40 for our last brooder on the end. So we had one, two, three, four. So for this one then, we were at 200, so we still need a one inch. And then for this one, we were now at um, 120. So we're at that row. So we had 120 and then 80 and then 40. So at 120 now, we can actually get away with a three-quarter pipe for that section. For 80, 
go up to our chart. Um, we still exceed the capacity of a half inch um, to ensure no more than a uh, half an inch of um, pressure drop. Um, so we're still up at the three quarter. Uh, and now 40, we can actually see that we could get away with one half inch pipe there. So you can see that there'd be several ways to, to do this. You could just run um, um, a, a one and a quarter pipe to there, and then a one inch pipe to there, and then a three quarter, and then a half. Or you could maybe think that um, you're going to run one and a quarter here, and then you just run one inch the whole way to the end. Um, some of that evaluation um, would happen based on just material price. But um, this is how we would use the chart to get the, the minimum pipe size recommendations um, to size our line. So we can go ahead and um, do the other side as well. Um, I've pre-populated um, these. So for this section then of pipe, we can go through the same process. Um, so in this section, we had the nine brooders. Um, so we're looking at that row. So that's 360. This section was eight brooders, so that's 320. This section would then be 280. This section would then be 240. And there again, I'm just um, going off the number of brooders times the capacity of each brooder, um, and then um, getting rid of the, the three zeros. Um, so this one is 200. And this one is 160. And this one is 120. And now this guy needs to supply both brooders. So we stay at 80 BTUs or thousands of BTUs um, because we're supplying both of the end brooders with that. So then we go back to our chart again, and we can just quickly go through and list in um, the pipe sizes based on the chart. So for 360, we were at one and one quarter pipe size. At 320, we were still at one and one quarter pipe size. At 280, we were still at uh, one and one quarter requirement. Um, for that one. Now for this next one, uh, at 243, we only need 240. Um, so we can drop to the one inch uh, pipe. Uh, at 200, we still need the one inch pipe. At 160, um, we still need the one inch pipe. At 120 now, we have enough capacity out of a three quarter inch pipe. And 80 for our last supply section. Um, we need more than the half inch. Um, so we would need three quarter the whole way to the end of the left branch line. So that's the, the basics of using the longest length method and um, and then evaluating the pipe size for each using the tables that are provided in the uh, International uh, Fuel and Gas Code book. Now back to um, some of the, the piping um, that we were talking about for the tubing at the end. Um, we've noticed um, some of these types of things and I just wanted to, um, to draw a little bit of attention to that. Um, so that is the section here. And we know that we've already calculated this, that um, the horizontal or the vertical, which is horizontal out across the ceiling, distance from the supply schedule 40 pipe to the brooder um, is 7.1 meters minus three. So that's at least uh, 4.1 meters um, straight across. And then it's not right at the ceiling. So we're at least turning and going one meter lower um, than the ceiling or, uh, or something like that. And that would be, you know, whatever your distance is there. Um, so you'd be, you know, coming up and 
going over to your supply. So it's at least a minimum of 5.1 meters, um, which is you know 16, almost 17 feet. Uh, if we wrap several coils up here, now we can easily add you know five, 10 feet to that number, um, which changes our longest length method too, because we added that section in, but assumed um, that this was the dimension that we were using. Um, so I just wanted to point out that within this, um, within this chart, here again, we have um, our correct header with uh, propane and 11 inches of water column. Um, I am not sure uh, exactly the classification of the the hose, the tube that you use. Um, this is the the closest one um, that I had here. Um, so it's it would be important when you guys are sizing your lines to to maybe even go back to the manufacturer uh, and try to see if they have um, any of the tables like this that would um, show the supply um, and the pressure drop um, given a certain number of BTUs per hour and then the length of the the tube that you're using. Um, but for sake of um, continuing this discussion, um, I just wanted to, to point out that if you wanted to maintain a half inch of pressure drop from the supply regulator to the last brooder, including the tube itself, the supply tube, um, then we would need to follow the 250 foot out across here. And you know that we have uh, a requirement of 40 for each brooder, which is 40,000 BTUs. Um, so if you were gonna maintain a half inch of water column drop um, to the very last brooder, then using the longest length method, um, you would actually be in this column. Um, so it would say that you need a three quarter inch hose to supply that. Um, and so you can go over here with the three quarter and that's almost, um, you know, at least for this one, it's almost a one inch uh, or three quarter inch or something like that inside diameter for that hose. Um, I don't have an ID, but the, the jacket outside of the jacket of this one is 0.92 inches. Um, so, you know, if it's more common to use a, a three eighth, um, so it's something to be aware of that if you have say 20 feet um, of hose there, then we're we're just a little bit under the 40. Um, so is that a big deal? Well, yes and no. It's a big deal if you're having trouble getting and maintaining the correct pressure at the last brooder. Um, but you can get away with it as long as we understand that we're going to get more, a little bit more pressure drop. And so how we have to compensate for that is by adjusting um, the pressure at the beginning of the line. Um, so the question would be, what should the starting pressure be at the second stage regulator? Um, so we know that at this point, we want at least 11 inches of water column. And we've already determined that um, in this hose, we're probably getting at least half an inch of water column because we're using a, a hose smaller uh, than what our chart would say. And it's probably longer than what our chart says too. So uh, it's at least half an inch of water column here. Um, and we also noted that from getting, getting the fuel the whole way down from there to there, if we designed according to the table, we are assured at least of another half inch of water column that we would have to add to that 11 inches uh, to get back to here. But then we also talked about the fact that a fitting here, a T, adds uh, additional pressure drop. The elbow up here adds additional pressure drop. Um, so, you know, maybe you figure that all your fittings combined is another half an inch. So, the pressure then 
at this regulator coming out, 11 inches of water column plus half for this hose, plus another half for our yellow line, plus another half at least for um, our fittings. We add those together and we would say that it, it's at least 12 inches of water column at the regulator in order to ensure when all the brooders are running that you maintain 11 inches. Um, so to be to be safe, um, we'd recommend maybe starting at more 13 inches. Um, and all the while remembering that at this first brooder in the series, um, we wanna make sure that we are not exceeding 14 inches of water column uh, to those brooders. So we can apply the same method then um, for the supply line um, for all of the houses. So the first thing that we would, we would do is we would determine what charts we need. Um, and as we mentioned, um, I believe you guys are using a 10 PSI supply pressure line. Um, so we would look at the chart in the handbook. We would look for the propane. We would look for the 10 PSI and the material that we're using. Um, so we have um, you know, the right chart here. And then we would start the same way. So we would look for the longest length. Um, in this case, since our supply is really here, um, our length is all of that distance. Um, so we have um, all of these dimensions down here. So we can add all of those up. And if we add all of those up, um, I get 159 meters. And if we do our conversion, that is um, 521.7 feet. So, we know that on our table, we go down the length column until we um, get to the capacity or the, the length that is uh, greater than or equal to the length we calculated for the longest length. So we would be in the 550 foot row. And here again, now we have our capacities. And so we can determine the capacities of each barn. Um, and then we can use that to determine the pipe sizes. Um, so determining the length of each. In this first section, we need to see that we are supplying the fuel for all six barns. Um, well, we already said that each, each house was 720,000 BTUs per hour. And so when we multiply that by six houses, we end up with 4,320,000 BTUs per hour. And we get rid of the three zeros to match the units on our chart. And so what we're looking for in this section is uh, a capacity of at least 4,320. Um, so we follow the chart up and that places us right in here. And so we go up and we see that 
in this section, we need a one and a half inch pipe supplying 10 PSI. So then we can look at the next and that would be supplying five houses now. Um, so we have 720,000 times five and that gives us 3,600,000 BTUs. So we're going to be looking at 3,600. So we still exceed the capacity in a one and a quarter. So we're up at one and a half still for that section. For the next section now, we're multiplying by four barns and that gives us 2,880,000. So we're looking at 2,880. So we see now that um, our one and a quarter can supply enough BTUs per hour. So we would be able to use one and one quarter inch here. Moving on, now we're three, which is 2,160,000. So looking at 2,160, we still exceed the capacity of a one inch. So we're up at the one and a quarter still. The next line is times two and that would give us 1,440,000. So we're at the 1,400 and we can see that our one inch will supply 1,500. So in this section, we should be able to use a one inch. And then in the last branch of our supply line, that's just times one. So it's 720,000. So we're looking at 720. And we see that a half inch supplies 380, but a three quarter would supply seven, um, 795. So we should be able to use a three quarter inch there. And there again, we could run one and a half inch the whole way. We could step anything uh, any way we want with two different sizes, as long as we um, are equal to or exceed the pipe sizes that are the minimum requirement. Um, and there again, if I'm starting with 10 PSI here, this chart is for a one PSI drop. So I have a minimum of um, one PSI loss through this line. Um, so I would have a minimum of nine PSI here, but there again, with all of the fittings and things that we did not calculate in, um, it could definitely be more than that. If you know uh, all the fittings that are used, all the T's and uh, elbows and things like that, that are used in the supply line, uh, there again in the appendix of the International Fuel Gas Code, you can look up at the equivalent length of each fitting and you can um, add those equivalent lengths into the longest length method um, to ensure that um, you're getting the um, pressure drop and supply pressure at the end of the line um, that you intend to. That's all I have um, for this uh, capacity presentation. Uh, if there are any questions. Alguien tiene alguna alguna pregunta este que quieran hacer que haya quedado alguna duda. Le yes, I, que... have, I have a question. Thank you. It's uh, Julian. Yes, go ahead. Yes, suppose we uh, don't have a change in the in the diameter of the line. What would be its repercussion? What's going to be the problem if you, if the um, 
our client does not change the size of the pipe. It continues uh, like uh, one and a half inches all through the, the gallon, the, the house. And uh, is it going to be a problem with that? Good question. Go ahead, Ben. Um, so are you talking uh, in the supply line from the tanks to each barn or in the barn itself? Uh, both of them. Okay. But in both uh, cases. Okay. Um, if they're using, uh, for example, uh, I'll just use this as, as an example, and then you can ask a follow-up question if you want, um, if I'm not explaining um, right. In this, in this case, um, if, if they had a one and a half inch supply line and it went the whole way from the tanks to the last barn, um, that would be a good thing because that would ensure that you're getting even less pressure drop than what um, the chart would say. Uh, if, however, they're using a one inch line and going the whole way, um, now you're in a different uh, situation where you would have a lot more pressure drop um, than what the chart would be. Uh, and then what you would really need to, to verify is that um, at the very last barn, at the very last brooder, when all the brooders in all of the site is running, do you have the pressure uh, requirement of at least 11 inches? Because that's the most critical thing. Um, you could size, there's different charts for even different pressure drops that would give you different pipe sizes, but you have to account for that when you're sizing your regulators uh, or when you're selecting your right supply pressure at the barn. Um, so in the, in the barn itself, uh, if you, let me go back up here. Um, so in this scenario, if they had one and a half inches um, coming in and going the whole way down the barn, um, rather than stepping down, that would be a good thing. That would just mean that there'd be less pressure drop um, than what we would have calculated in this method. So that would, um, would not be a problem. So in the end, it's just a matter of budget. If the client uh, can afford to pay for, the, for that pipe, uh, so it's okay. It's uh, good for for him. Yep. As long as um, as long as it's sized right at the beginning, if they want to use that, I think in in our um, in our yeah in in this supply line, the first branch that came across from the regulator, we had one and a half. So you know, if they were able to afford running that one and a half the whole way, yes, that would be a good thing because it would be uh, less pressure drop. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Thanks for that. No sé si tengan alguna otra pregunta. Eh, Yo tengo una yes. pregunta, Eduardo, si es que me puedes ayudar un poco. Claro. Tengo una, una pregunta. ¿Cuál es la diferencia entre este dimensionamiento, cierto, donde vemos que la cañería o la tubería de entrada es de una pulgada y media, pero cuando revisamos la última parte de la presentación, vimos que la última, el último galpón, ¿correcto? Eh, necesitaría una cañería de tres cuartos. Me quedo esa duda. Ok. Um, I'm going to answer it because I know the, the answer. Bueno, Rodrigo, lo que pasa es eh, que conforme va bajando el requerimiento de creadoras al, al frente de la línea, ¿sí? se requiere menor cantidad de volumen de gas eh, o de BTUs a, a quemar. Por lo tanto, eso nos este, va, va bajando la, el requerimiento del diámetro de la línea conforme vamos avanzando. Esa, es la crea, eh, esa línea era la línea de distribución de los tanques de almacenamiento ¿Sí? a través de todos los galpones. Entonces, este, entonces conforme vas pasando un galpón, ¿sí? ya no necesitas tener más diámetro de, de tubería porque ya dejaste atrás 18 creadoras por galpón, ¿sí? Entonces vas bajando, vas bajando la, de, la necesidad de, de gas, por eso puedes ir reduciendo esa tubería. Que si sí. el cliente puede dejarla continua, pues es lo ideal. Pero, ok, entonces en este caso, si nosotros hubiéramos el, hacemos el análisis del 
del galpón que está más cercano a la, a, a la fuente, ¿cierto? A los estanques, ahí era una cañería de una pulgada y media, ¿sí? Ajá. Eso no entiendo. Y el, el, la cola, la última criadora, o sea, el último galpón, necesita una entrada de tres cuartos. Sí. ¿Correcto? Perfecto. Sí. Pero cuando partimos con la presentación, partimos con que el ingreso del galpón era en una pulga y media. Ok, pero eso es a partir de tu regulador eh, secundario. ¿sí? Esa era mi pregunta. Ok, Así es, entonces porque... hay una diferencia entre el regulador primario, por eso se llama, era por etapa. ¿Cierto? Así es, así es. Lo que pasa es que la primera Perfecto. sección de la línea va en alta presión, a 10 PCI, Perfecto. y la segunda presión, a partir del segundo regulador, empezamos a eh, entre 11 y lo que decía ahí Ben en el cálculo que hizo, aproximadamente 13 columnas de pulgadas Perfecto. de agua en el, en el regulador secundario al diámetro de una pulgada a un cuarto. Entonces, al bajar, al nosotros al bajar presión necesitamos más, más diámetro. Por eso es que pasamos este, de tres cuartos a una pulga y media nuevamente. Es correcto, como tenemos más presión. Los reguladores son, son los, la razón son los reguladores, que unos son de alta presión y otros de baja presión. Así es, o tu línea la estás calculando a baja presión porque nuestras creadoras, las creadoras que tienen ahí son de baja Perfecto. presión. Perfecto, ya, es que esa era la única, la única, la única duda que tenía. Perfecto. Okay. Le, le voy a bueno. comentar a, a, a Ben y a ellos en inglés, nomás para que sepan lo que, lo que conversamos. Sí, sí, no, pero está bien, perfecto. Eh, ben, just to let you know. Uh, they ask why we can uh, deliver gas in, at the front of the house, the last one, at three quarters inches uh, pipe diameter, and then we need to increase the diameter after the second regulator or the regulator in front of the house. I already told them because we changed the pressure on the line in that point. So that's why we need to increase the size of the, the, uh, the pipe going into the house because uh, if, uh, after the second regulator they have only 13 inches of water column or something between 11 to 13 or 14 so that's why uh, i asked them that situation i answered that excellent alguna otra pregunta que tengan Esto, no eh, también como rigo un comentario, no una pregunta, es agradecerles porque en la, en la capacitación se vieron eh, pues básicamente todos los, los eh, problemas a los que nos hemos enfrentado durante este año y pues yo creo que con esto queda homologado de alguna forma eh, eh, las buenas prácticas que debemos tener. Eh, si nos apoyas con, el, con la marca, el modelo del, del medidor de, de presión que usáis, eso. Pues sería, eso, sería estupendo porque lo podemos conseguir por Amazon y tener esa herramienta a mano. Eso, y lo, y lo otro, si nos puedes compartir todo lo que hemos revisado en esta capacitación también, Eduardo. ¿Mm? Sí, claro. Este, no, pues gracias a ustedes por, por la participación, por, la, sí. por el apoyo, por la representación. Y, este, y, con, y con gusto aquí, miren, aquí les comparto, les paso la información por escrito, pero para que quede grabado, ese es el medidor de presión que, o el manómetro que usamos. Este y, y ahí está el modelo y la marca y otra cosa y quiero que destacarlo de verdad eh, no sé si está Luis ahí Luis de los sí, 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 está por ahí presente yo de verdad lo felicito porque estuvo excelente de verdad fue, fue cumplió y superó nuestra expectativa por lo menos las mías el equipo de Chile está participando, ¿cierto? Ellos, ellos no participaron de este, de este tema puntual de lo que fue Quinsagro, pero sí interesante que ellos lo, lo vean y, y, y les doy las gracias. ¿Cómo se, disculpa, ¿cómo se llama la persona que nos presentó ahora? Hoy? Creo que, bueno, en realidad, uh -huh. a todo el equipo y por haberse dado el tiempo de explicarnos cómo se hacía el dimensionamiento, porque de verdad, para nosotros que estamos en esto, fue... Eh, cumplieron el objetivo cada día. De verdad, fue mucho más de lo que nosotros esperábamos. Los felicito okay. y muchas gracias, Eduardo. Felicítanos, gracias. por favor, a todo el equipo. Es lo que voy a hacer en este momento. Um, they, they say that they want to say thank you for all the team that uh, make it possible. They are very uh, happy with the training. They, they uh, say thanks for all the support that we can give them in the situation. Uh, they understand everything very well. And they are going to review the recording of the session. And if they have any question, they will let them know. 
but they they say thank you for Jamin, Ben, uh, all the people uh, in the uh, back side of this uh, that it make it possible. So uh, also I say thank you for all you to uh, give uh, help us, help Liz and me to uh, have this training. And uh, it's the first of many that we can do uh, for different things. So again, thank you very much. And uh, we are we are ready to go. So thank you again. And y bueno, gracias a ustedes nuevamente eh, por todo el apoyo. Eh, gracias por la representación que hacen de la marca en los países que nos ayudan. Para nosotros es sumamente importante hacer esa colaboración entre Novagri, eh, Balco, para que podamos eh, seguir teniendo más ventas, más, más este equipo en campo y, y que estén funcionando apropiadamente. Cuentan con nuestro respaldo, con nuestro apoyo y, y vamos a planear algo de este tipo de, de entrenamiento en las situaciones que nos encontramos hoy en día, que no podemos estar viajando tanto. Eh, cada equipo que vendamos o que no, no hayamos instalado como, como Novagre, este, pues tratar de hacer algo similar para que estén listos al momento de llegar a campo y saber cómo, cómo poderlo desarrollar. Thank you. Excellent job. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Very well, mister. Very well. Thank, thank you, you guys ben. for tuning in. Thank you, Ben. Thank you, Jamin. Yep. Hope you guys have a good rest of your day. Mm -hmm. well. Yeah, you have you have a good day too. Yes. Thank See you, you for joining. Let us know if there's any anything else that we can help you with or or do like this virtually to to assist you guys in what uh, what you're trying to accomplish too. Hey. <laughs> De mi parte le doy las gracias a todos, al, al, tanto al personal técnico que participó esto, Eduardo, por el, el tremendo apoyo, eh, tanto técnico y colaborador, eh, a todos ustedes, los técnicos y los, los, eh, los miembros de, de esta eh, organización Novagri en Sudamérica, eh, Colombia, Julián, muchísimas gracias Julián por la participación, espero que esto realmente eh, le haya ayudado a a resolver algunos de esos problemitas que hemos tenido lamentablemente en Colombia, eh, la parte que, que manejo yo, eh, pero ya para eh, más adelante, entonces, más preparado para los otros próximos proyectos que vengan, eh, no solamente ahí en Colombia, sino en los otros países que ustedes, Novagri, pues manejan con Eduardo, y eh, sientan siempre el apoyo nuestro, el apoyo tanto de, eh, tanto de Eduardo como mío, como de personal técnico. Así que le doy las gracias a todos por la participación. Eh, Jamie, Ben, thank you. Eh, Kayla, thank you for, for, for the wonderful job. Eh, well done. Thank you. Muchas gracias, Luis. Thank you guys. Bye. Gracias. Hasta luego. Saludos a todos. Thank you very much. See Everybody. you. See you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.